Hello, I'm Chris Moravec from the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and my topic today is strategies to improve heart-brain health. Dr. McKee, in his presentation, has already addressed the topic of excessive stress reactions and their potential role in disease progression. I will talk today about our research program, which is designed to stop excessive arousal and interfere with the process of disease progression. The body's stress reactions are caused by the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system has also been called the automatic nervous system because it's responsible for the involuntary functions which control things like respiration, heartbeat, and digestion. For many years, we believed that the autonomic nervous system was beyond conscious control, but we're now aware that each of us has the ability to regulate our autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system has two branches, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system is responsible for what we refer to as the fight-or-flight reaction. You are all familiar with the fight-or-flight reaction from the panic response. That is, when you feel a level of panic, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, you breathe faster and shallower, and your hands normally feel cold and clammy. The parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system is also often called the rest and digest branch. That is, it's responsible for everything that happens in a normal, calm, restorative area of your life. When you're not panicking, your heart is beating slowly, you're breathing calmly and rhythmically, you can digest food, you can relax, and those are all functions of the parasympathetic nervous system. Ideally, the input of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems is perfectly balanced, such that on a daily basis, we are able to live our lives in a calm and restorative way. But when we need to activate the body, such as when we want to exercise or if we need to jump up and run out of this room in response to something, the sympathetic nervous system allows us to do that by accelerating our heartbeat, increasing our respiration, and other physiologic reactions. But when that response is over, we come back to the parasympathetic nervous system and are again able to live in a calm and restorative place. For most of us, however, given the pace of daily life, the sympathetic nervous system is actually overactivated, and we generally see that the parasympathetic nervous system is underactivated in many individuals. As Dr. McKee mentioned in his talk, when we become the salmon swimming upstream, we activate a lot of physiological responses which actually lead to either the development of the d disease or disease progression. Our research program, funded by the Bakken Heart Brain Institute, is designed to test the hypothesis that we can get the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system back into balance and make people healthier. We use a process called biofeedback in our research. Biofeedback is a training program. It's a way to teach people to regulate their own bodies and therefore hopefully to restore a good balance of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system balance. Biofeedback acts like a mirror. You might think that you normally look into a mirror and adjust your hair, your hat, your lipstick. In biofeedback, we look into a body mirror. We are able to see what is our heart rate, what is our respiratory rate, how tense are our muscles, and we're able to make adjustments to bring them back in the direction of health and wellness. The patients who are involved in our research studies really like the process of biofeedback training because we're able to give them a tool that they can use on their own to decrease their reactions to stress and hopefully to make their clinical conditions better. In biofeedback, as you observe here, the patient or volunteer is relaxing in a comfortable chair. Around the waist, you see a respiratory belt, which is measuring abdominal respiration, both its frequency and its depth. On the fingers, you see sensors, which monitor temperature and skin conductance or sweatiness. And around the left wrist, you see an EKG band, which will monitor heart rate and heart rate variability. All of these sensors are at above the level of the clothing, and they are comfortable and cause no discomfort for the patient. The sensors feed into a computer. Here you see Dr. McKee working with a volunteer, and he is working with that volunteer on respiration, trying to train her to breathe slowly, deeply, abdominally, and with a rhythmic pattern. In biofeedback training, we normally work with one physiologic parameter at, the t at a time, but our goal, of course, is to have them all tracked together and have the patient be in control of all of these physiologic variables. The hypothesis of our research program is that teaching people to regulate their own bodies using biofeedback can actually help those who are suffering from chronic disease by improving their clinical status, improving their quality of life, and hopefully halting or reversing their disease progression. 
In addition to the fact that we are using this technique with patients who have a clinical condition, I should mention that biofeedback is also routinely used in stress management and wellness applications. We have three ongoing biofeedback projects at this time. We are studying the use of biofeedback in patients waiting for heart transplant. We are doing a proof of concept study in patients with coronary artery disease, diabetes, and multiple sclerosis. And we are in the process of developing a handheld biofeedback device. I will mention each of these projects briefly in the next few minutes, but I'd like to point out that in this forum, I am unable to present unpublished data. And so if you're interested in seeing the data that I specifically refer to, you will be able to find it when it is published. First, let me talk about patients who are waiting for a heart transplant at Cleveland Clinic. These patients have end-stage heart failure, and their only hope is a heart transplant. We have studied 27 of them so far. 11 of them have been outpatients who come in weekly for biofeedback sessions, and 16 of them have been patients who are waiting in the hospital for a heart transplant. The first thing we do in biofeedback training with all of our patients and with the patients with heart disease is to teach them to breathe. Most of us, if you check right now, you'll find that you're breathing at about 12 to 14 breaths per minute. But it turns out that if we could train ourselves to breathe six breaths per minute with the exhalation phase being slightly longer than the inhalation phase, we would feel much better and our bodies would be much happier. You can try this at home. Use a watch or use a clock and time yourself to one breath equaling 10 seconds with the inhalation being about four seconds and the exhalation being about six seconds. If you can train yourself to do this regularly, you'll find that you actually feel much better. In our heart failure patients, we were not sure they would have the capability to do this. They're waiting for a heart transplant, and so they obviously have cardiopulmonary dysfunction. Most of them came into the study breathing at 17 or 18 breaths per minute, and we were not sure we'd be able to decrease their breathing rate. But I'm happy to report to you that all of our patients, all 27 of them, were actually able to learn to breathe at a much slower rate, to learn to make their exhalation a little bit slower, a little bit longer than their inhalation, and they all felt much better for the process of doing this. They were able to get their respiration down to often seven or even six breaths per minute. Another parameter that we train to or at least measure in our studies is heart rate variability. You might be surprised to hear that under normal conditions, your heart rate is variable. Probably intuitively, most of us think that a heart rate of 72, for example, would be constant. But it turns out that every time you breathe in, your heart rate goes up a little bit, and every time you breathe out, your heart rate goes down a little bit. Those are under control of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, and it turns out that that variability gives the heart a great deal of adaptability, and so I've also called it cardiovascular flexibility. It's the parameter that allows us to regulate our heart when we need to regulate our heart. And it turns out that heart rate variability is a mark of a healthy heart, and a lack of heart rate variability is a mark of a diseased heart. So I'm happy to tell you that in our heart failure patients waiting for heart transplants, about half of them were actually able to regulate their heart rate variability in the direction of health and wellness. That's certainly a comment on the potential of biofeedback to interfere with even end-stage clinical conditions. One of the things that's really unique about our study of end-stage heart failure patients is that we are able to go to the operating room. Here you see PhD student Dana Frank, who is going to the operating room to retrieve the heart of a patient who is having a heart transplant. So the patient gets a new, a new heart and we get their old heart. This allows us to study, after we've completed biofeedback training in a heart failure patient, what has actually happened to the heart. Have we been able to cause any degree of recovery on the cellular level, on the muscle level, on the molecular level? And so it's a real strength of this particular study. On a gross level and also on a cellular level, the failing heart does not look like a normal heart. The failing heart is bigger, it's baggier, and it doesn't pump as well. And that is dictated by changes at the level of the muscle, the cell, and the molecule. So when we bring these failing hearts back to the laboratory, one of the things we do is take muscles from the internal surface of the left ventricle, and we hook them up, as you see here, to study them in the laboratory. And from each patient, we're able to study 15 or 16 individual muscles so that we're sure that we're getting a good representation of what's going on in the heart. What we look at is how well is the muscle contracting, how well is the muscle relaxing, and how well does the muscle respond to things like chemicals which would normally stimulate it to improve its function in the body. Here you see a bar graph which gives us the extent to which muscles are responding to a stimulus that would normally occur in the body. 
On the left of the screen, you see a pink bar representing muscles taken from patients who did not have heart failure. These are non-failing muscles. And what you see is that there's a normal response. You'll have to take my word for it that about 160, 170% is a normal response to this particular stimulation. The failing muscles are shown in yellow, and you see that there's a greatly decreased response. The failing heart does not have this response, which we normally think is important. On the right, in blue, you see a group that I haven't mentioned yet, but that I will mention now, and those are patients who have a particular kind of pump while they're waiting for transplant. The pump is called an LVAD, and it gets implanted when patients are waiting for a heart transplant, but they're too sick to wait much longer, and it helps them to wait. When we take muscles from those patients, we see that the response that we're showing here is partially recovered. That is, the blue bar is greater than the yellow bar, but not quite as great as the pink bar. So in this particular group of patients who have this particular kind of pump, we've shown that the heart is able to recover, that it's able to move back in the direction of non-failing. We've now done this same experiment with patients who have come to transplant after biofeedback training. And although I'm not showing you the raw data here, the patients who have had biofeedback training actually recover to a greater degree than the patients who have been supported by this pump shown in the blue bar. So we've shown a degree of recovery from heart failure, at least in the patients who have come to transplant so far, which is very promising for this biofeedback therapy, and we hope to be going further and studying this more in the future. So what I'm telling you is that the failing heart shown in pink looks different from the non-failing heart shown in yellow, and that biofeedback, in addition to other types of interventions that have been shown to do this, can cause at least some degree of reversal in the direction of the non-failing heart. The second project I'll mention briefly today is what I've referred to as a proof of concept study. And what that means is that in this study, we're asking not only can biofeedback help the patients, but what is the mechanism by which biofeedback helps the patients? Does it do what we think it's doing? Does it change the biological pathways that we think it's changing? In this particular study, we're studying three populations of patients, those with coronary artery disease, those with type 2 diabetes, and those with stable multiple sclerosis. We're providing biofeedback training for these patients, but at the same time, we are measuring various markers in their blood, which represent the pathways that we think are changed, and we're also measuring heart rate variability, which I've told you is an indicator of cardiovascular flexibility or the role of the autonomic nervous system in the patients. This study is a randomized clinical trial, which means that half of the patients in each group are getting biofeedback training, and half of the patients in each group are just getting usual care and not getting biofeedback training. In all patients, however, these blood markers and heart rate variability are measured, so that in the end, we will be able to determine if biofeedback had an effect on patients with these three diseases, was it by changing a particular biologic pathway associated with the autonomic nervous system? And that will help us to understand the potential of this therapy. Finally, let me touch on our creation of a handheld biofeedback device. Biofeedback, as I mentioned in the beginning, is a training method. It's a lot like learning a foreign language. That means that in between training sessions, you have to practice it at home or you're not going to learn it as well as you would otherwise. So we, we would like to have a device that we can send home with our patients for them to practice. There are several devices on the market which uh, are biofeedback devices, but unlike those, ours allows patients to work with three different physiologic parameters at one time. It includes a respiratory pacing ball, and it has data storage so that the patient can track their own progress, see how they were doing last week as compared to this week, and also take out the memory card, bring it into the clinic, and report to us or to their physician how they have done with home practice. We have had some interest in this device so far. Of course, we are interested in using it for our patients for home training. We've also had some interest from um, people who are interested in the fact that women do not as frequently attend cardiac rehabilitation because they often can't spare the time to come to the clinic or the hospital for an hour a week or three hours a week, but they might be interested in doing something at home for 15 or 20 minutes a day, which could help them. We've had some interest from the military in using our handheld biofeedback device for performance enhancement. And we are also working with several corporations about using our handheld biofeedback device for wellness applications. We filed a U.S. patent for this device in November of 2010. So all of these are very exciting avenues of research, and we're grateful to the Bakken Heart Brain Institute for providing the seed funding that has allowed us to get these research areas started. Thank you.